Hi, I'm Phil Myra. I'm currently on Kickstarter with all three volumes of Crackle. Crackle is a self-published, self-contained anthology series. All sorts of room by myself, and I've been lucky to collaborate with artists from all over the world. And you can find it at cracklecomics.com or just on Kickstarter at Crackle Volume 3. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very new person, in, at least in my field of view, but he's been writing for a while now. I have read, read rather, volumes one through three, uh, at least most of three that, that I was able to see, of his series called Crackle, a wonderful collection of short stories, amazing themes, great art, and, uh, you know, it's a really powerful couple of volumes, which also has a Kickstarter as well, too. We're joined today by the ever-talented Philip Meyer. How are you doing, Philip? I'm doing great, Kurt. I, I love new comics. I love new writers. I love the fact that I see something new every day with, with every person that I get to interview on this particular show. And I was blown away by not only the writing styles and the different stories that, that I got to read from at least volume one and two for sure. But you, you had some powerful imagery, you had some powerful uh, uh, words and, and artists. And, you know, I really want to dive into this here as a whole. We'll start with volume one as well, too. But for those that don't know what Crackle is all about, tell us what it's all about. Sure. Crackle is self-contained short stories. They're all bundled into uh, separate volumes. Uh, <laughs> volume one and volume two, and then we're kickstarting for volume three right now. So um, everything's complete. Volume one and two have been done for a couple of years. They're the short stories, comic short stories that I've created. Benchmark is maybe about a year, 16, 18 months. And at that point, the artists and I have worked really hard to make sure that these are very concise short stories. These aren't pitches to show to editors. These aren't scenes, even the one pagers that are that are in some of these ones, they feel like short stories. There's narrative beginning, middle and end. First volume was about the first my first year as a creator. They're, the stories are a little bit shorter, but they still pack that emotional punch. And it's kind of what you said, Kurt, they're, I'm mostly writing dramas. Uh, I call dramas less life. So there's little bits of magical realism, which I've always enjoyed and some fantasy elements. My main focus is to tell stories about people, people making decisions, people living with those decisions, seeing the consequence of those decisions. Like it's very all character focused, like the cliche of like people sitting in a room just talking to each other, but there's other things happening. There might be supernatural things happening or they might be supernatural. But in the long run, it's just people dealing with problems and the characters growing through there. Like I said, even if the one pagers, there's there should be some. I try to make even some growth from the beginning panel to the last panel, and you as the reader can feel and see it. You definitely do, for sure. Thank you. I mean, you've done an amazing, amazing job with it, truly. Uh, volume two came out uh, like I think it was like either April or May of last year. So we're, we're getting right into the middle of, or like right in the start of the pandemic. The artists and I have now come out with this third volume that we're eager to share with everyone. This newest third volume is slightly larger than volume one and two combined because the artists and I just keep expanding our skill set. There are some continuing artists that do multiple stories within the different volumes, but each of the stories themselves are self-contained. But now that I'm progressing as a, as a writer and more ingrained in the co indie commerce community, I'm meeting more artists that I've always admired and we can create stories together. And so from there, we are starting to create longer narratives because I have that skill set that I can make an interesting story that doesn't feel like fluff and it doesn't feel like it meanders at certain points. And the artists have that skill set because they are highly skilled storytellers as well. If I can go on a side tangent, um, I was working, the first story I ever did in, is the first story in Crackle One. And it's Toulouse uh, 42378, but I just call it Toulouse. 
Hannah Wenzel and I. Hannah is a phenomenal German uh, artist, and she was the first artist that I ever contacted. The first thing I did was I wrote a comic book script first. That was my initial foray, and I was like, all right, well, there was no inciting incident. I was like, let me see if I can make a comic book script. And it was five pages. And so from there, I was like, all right, well, I did this. It's just a script. It's not... It's not really worth anything. It's not worth its grain of salt. No, you're not going to hand someone a script when you're friends. They're not. They're going to be like, you know, they're like Phil. Thank you, but I'm not doing this. <laughs> like, so I was like, yeah, all right. Well, the next step is to find artists. So I found Hannah around this. It was actually around this time because it was around Inktober of I think four years ago, and I found one of her illustrations that she she did one of her daily illustrations and I looked at her profile and I had comic experience and I sent her the script and I said, you know, what I loved about her art, um, how much is her page rate, what's her schedule? And I had, and I sent her the complete script to see if she'd be interested. And she was, we ended up working on that story and we've worked on this crack of volume three is our fourth story together. What I wanted to actually get around with was, like trusting your artists because I sent Hannah a nine page script for the story that's in volume three. It's called loops at a spool. Hannah being the phenomenal storyteller that she is. If you read enough stories from around the world, comics from around the world, you know, different regions have different types of storytelling and beats. And so she comes from the German market, which is, you know, like the European market. So they have a lot of, either silent panels or silent pages and just the, the rhythm is very, it's more slowed down. I don't know how else to put it compared to American comics or like North American comics. When she looked at a nine page script, she's like, all right, well, I'm thumbnailing and I feel that it should be more. She's like, I think it's going to be either be between 14 or 20 pages. I trusted her initially, and then she sent me the thumbnails when she eventually had it all mapped out. It ended up being 17 pages, and I can't see it any other way. I mean, you read it, Kurt. It's, it's just, I think it's perfectly paced. That's what I loved about it, because that's what drew me in that first story. And then seeing in volume three, the continuation of it is just really well done, and and. The, and it wasn't slow. It wasn't, it was just perfectly paced that it was a nice, easy read that you could digest every panel and every section. It, the beats were very, very smooth. Yeah. And it was just like, by the time I got to the end of it, I'm like, crap, this is it. I want more. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people here are, are aspiring or are in the indie comics community. So everyone kind of looks, looks up quotes or like how to write type of, or how to, uh, I'm not sure about the drawing per se, but I know like as a writer, you're always like how to draw, drawing tips and stuff. And the one that always pops up, or at least for me that I kept seeing popping up is you want your audience to feel like they're coming late to a party and they're leaving early for the party. Not the audience, the, the reader to feel that, you know, they're walking into something really cool and everything's exciting and everything's happening. And they're the ones playing catching up and trying to understand who these people are, what they're trying to do. There's just so many cool things, you know, on the page. And then you want them to feel like they're leaving early. Like, oh man, I want to see what happens next. I want more. That's what I have been cognizant of doing that. But also in the same sense, like you kind of touched on it, Kurt, it's, you know, you felt that it, it was complete. Like it wasn't like I didn't cliffhanger it or I didn't do any type of sudden, you know, shock value, just type of thing or like, artsy not artsy fartsy but it's just like ended ended with a nonsensical panel that you know that wouldn't be like an ending type of thing it would feel like there's complete another page character creation world creation yeah, yeah. we're going to touch on those two themes because those are extremely critical for the, the varying stories you have so let's start with the actual creation of the characters themselves what did you draw from to create these characters now we're not obviously going to go through all three volumes yeah. but let's let's start with at least your your primary story that kind of set this series up we can talk about toulouse then i had the idea of a woman a young mother who goes back to her family's house with her kids on christmas uh, or for christmas 
her father asks her where her husband is and she she doesn't know where she, where he is and that's like the inciting incident you know it could lead to any type of mystery you know abduction or any type of cold case type of things but for me i took it as a sign of like a failing marriage like an introspective look at a failing marriage and i was i'm currently married happily happily married um we just had her one year at the time I was not married. I wasn't even in a committed relationship. I was in my mid twenties. For some reason, I wanted to ex- explore this theme. But as far as the character creations, and for all my stories, I'm not sure if I have a very common uh, way to build characters. But I, I build dialogue and emotion. Mostly, emotion comes first, then dialogue. You know, it's like an onion. So, like inside, it's the emotion, then it's the dialogue. And then it's the scene, like whatever, whatever location, time period, because like I mentioned, Toulouse takes place, I think it takes place in the 90s or late 80s. The, f- the fourth layer, then be working out with the artist team. Um, well, it'd be the script. The script's complete after that. Once I know the emotion, the dialogue and who these characters are in which settings. Um, and then I guess it'd be just like, putting them and seeing how they interact. Like in my head, figuring out how these characters would interact and what choices they can make. Like the choices is a very big thing for me. To me, that's character growth. If you can have your character make a choice, I mean, more effective if you can, if you can have the character make the choice and it be nonverbal and, and it can be just be fully shown to the reader through visuals. then that's more effective in my mind. As far as making choices and having the characters make choices, I don't want to spoon feed the reader. That's why I said, like, I like to have it more, if I can make it a visual choice rather than a verbal choice. I trust that the reader is smart enough to make these these distinctions by themselves. That I, I can't just be like, then they chose to go up the mountain instead of around the mountain or something. I feel like that's kind of like talking down to the reader. If we just, if I, if I just throw everything as dialogue, it should be more of the characters going through a journey and you as the reader going through the journey with the characters. When they make a decision, you make a decision with them. Like I said, if I do that through dialogue, I feel that sometimes it just zaps you out of it because I think there's the reader you feel like less engaged. I think it's the show don't tell method, plain and simple. That's, that's yeah. what it goes down to. And that that's what all great writers and great screenplays and films and TV and books. If you can get a, a, a book or a comic that as, as you have created, has good pacing and good dialogue and good characters that you are invested in, no matter how long or short you're invested in the story in, then it, it balances out your enjoyment as a reader and uh, I'm sure as a creator as well too. To me, the script is just the first part of the process. It's not the script, you know, the script is golden. The script, we, that is the script is the plan. Like we stick to the plan no matter what. There's no revisions. I know that was type of the old, the old thing back in the day. I mean, I can speculate the quickness of, you know, comics needed to be made and produced quickly in a monthly time timetable and then there's always just like too many cooks in the kitchen so no one's really talking to each other that's why i try to complete the script first and then seek out the artists that would be best fit for that story they can get a better grasp of what the story is about versus me sending a facsimile of like bullet points or here's the first third of the story scripted Mm. and you know the rest the rest is in some type of form or fashion of what what it should be this way we can have a dialogue and what what works and what doesn't work like i mentioned like the script is something that to me is fluid that can constantly change i can go in and i can trim dialogue if toward the end after the thumbnail stage you know the the ink the pencils the inks the colors we're finally at the lettering stage and there's something that the artists and I feel that we have accomplished through the visuals. I, the one thing that I always remember, I was reading it right before I started writing. I think it's in volume five of Lock and Key, uh, mm-hmm. the comic. There was a part where Boda Bodhi, I can never remember how to pronounce his name, and Dodge, you know, there's, there's, there's always a clash throughout the whole narrative, but there's a part where like they're, they're walking through the ghost door and in, in the comic, 
there's no dialogue. It turned out that was a printing error. Someone just for that one page, someone didn't, someone used the wrong file for printing. Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez, they love the outcome of that. They're like, all right, well, this works better if they were just monologuing. It's just these two, two characters going through this moment. And I always just thought about that. It's like, you can, you know, you can get to the very end of the process and you can just realize silence is the best is, is the best for the situation. You know, comics has its own rhythm. So you have to trust that the rhythm that you set for that story, the, the reader's not going to go zip through the page because they just see, you know, no dialogue. But in the same sense, it's fine. I mean, if, 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 a char- if the reader goes through the page super fast because they don't see any dialogue and they just kind of see the visualness of it, then that's, I mean, that is also, that's the choice of the reader. It's one of those things that I keep that I always think about, like how to keep the readers on the page the longest so they feel more invested, but also how do is it okay if they don't spend as much time as I intend to, or the artists intend to for them to be on there because that is their choice, and that's that's what I love about comics. Like you can you can do anything as long as as long as the speech bubbles are correct and you're reading the panels in the correct, you know, the correct order, if there is a correct order, as long as that happens, you know, the reader can spend as much time as they want on the page and I can put all these little tricks. I mean, the one that I kind of did heavy with was, I can't believe it. I was beyond fortunate to collaborate with the wonderful um, New York artist, M. Dean, who I've, I've been a fan of her since her early, her early like web comics. Yep. And she's phenomenal. She, she does a couple things with fancy graphics. I mean, this is the first page, so it's not spoiling anything, but we have um, these four panels within themselves are, um, are a flashback and there's dialogue that wraps around. So that was our idea of to, to have the reader more engaged between the four and wrapped around. So the dialogue coincides with the flashback that also each flashback is its own moment. So to tie all the moments and we were constantly doing things. And like the next page, it's a giant splash page where if you wanted to take the time and follow the journey with, with the character as she and her, her gigantic floating jellyfish that changes colors descends into the darkness, you can, or you can be like, all right, there's, this is a visually, visually cool page. And I just know that this character goes from up to down and then that's fine by me. But giving the choice to the reader, I mean, like I said, it's all about, for me, it's choices. Like, so even that's a choice for the reader to interact with the story. I just think it's more fun it's just as a creator to figure out ways for the reader to interact. And, you know, sometimes there's some, stories within the first two volumes of Crackle that are more horizontal instead of, I've heard it called calendar. Yeah, I, I gave it to an editor one time. He's like, we don't do calendar stories. I'm like, there's, there's, there's two pages of this. That's another way for, we think that the, the reader can interact is if you're reading the physical copy at a point, you have to turn it. Ice Cream Man is one, is one of my favorite ongoing series right now. And Maxwell Prince and um, Martin Morasco or something, Morazico, um, the, the artist, those two are the phenomenal collaboration team. And this recent one that came out on Wednesday, I haven't read it yet, but they, it's called Family Tree. And it's the same thing. It's like a calendar, you know, it's a horizontal um, story. And he posted it on his Instagram. He's like, if you, it's supposed to be basically one continuous tree and you see like the lineage and he posted, he's like in a parking lot. And he's like, if you have five copies of this, you can just read it all down. He's like, it's 10 foot, 10 foot a story. Uh, that's another thing. They, they experiment. I write stories about people in rooms dealing with decisions and, and dealing with their problems. It's a collaboration. Like the, the artists, if you tell the artists to collaborate, to break things, to, you know, just to stir things up and try something new, you're going to get a better story. If anyone can listen to this, can take anything away from it. It's like I, the writer's not king. It's a collaboration process. We're all coming together to create something beautiful, something that doesn't exist. 
We are bringing things into existence for people to enjoy. It is magic. Like it's, it's in purest form. If you throw your ego into it, your ego is going to be at the end of it. So don't throw your ego into it. Make it something like a syn- synthesis, a, cl- a combination of fused elements that creates something wonderful. Experimentation always is, is interesting as well, too. And I'm glad that you're giving f- creative free reign to the creative artists that you're, you're joining because you're right. Creativity is, is something where, yes, you could go co- cookie cutter, but you could also explore the mindset of, of your creative people that you're working with. The theme aspect is what I really want to touch on because you've touched on this too. You said basically that, you know, you're, you're basically locking characters in a story and you're, they're forced to deal with their own problems. As a writer though, what themes in these stories spoke to you as a writer? I mean, the two main themes that I, that I explore is time and mortality. And it, it deals with us as humans dealing with the passage of time and how we grow, we grow in some form or fashion. We either, we don't, we never recede. There, there's some type of growth, even if it's negative growth. I think that's the best way to put it. And mortality, because that's the finite end, at least from one perspective, our, either the character's perspective or our perspective. There's always, there's always a finite end, even within the story. A few times I've used montages, but I've used montage sequence not to slip, like not to show progression growth or just to pass time. I use montages in a specific way to show points in history or like points within that character's life, kind of how I was touching upon before, but there is a flashback sequence with four panels. Those four panels have have very specific things doing inside them. They're, it's not there to show the person's progression. It does do that, but it also shows their point in time because that's, that's always interesting because a comic book is multiple points in time. Uh, I was thinking about this too in uh, Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics where there's that section where he talks about there's four different types of panel-to-panel comparisons you know, there's, there's one where it's like directly moments in time. Like I go, my hands here, my hands here. So that's, that's what it is. And then there's just like, I think there's like, you know, like non sequester. There's like, I think he has like a picture of a dinosaur and then like a picture of like the space. I can't remember what the, the other one is, but the, uh, but one is like a, a sequential, but like loose Time frame. time frame, yeah. And so it's like a guy raising, I'm guessing like a guy raising his axe and then outside is like a curtain, like outside, like the, a brick building and someone's screaming, ah! And that is what I think about the most is where you as the reader are making that connection. Because in that, in Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, he's like, you as the reader have killed that person. You made the connection between the axe and the screaming person and the exterior, and that death is on you. And I think about that all the time because, as mentioned, like I think of comics as several points in time, and you're trying to make the reader come up with these connections or make these connections within themselves. So it's not, you know, like I said, it's not the one to one moment in time you flip a coin and you, you watch eight panels of a coin flipping. Like it's, it's several dullness and that's a lot of hours on the art team to just render that. To go back to the mortality thing, I, I think it's as much as time is the slow, slow current that we all drift through, the mortality is something that, that is inevitable for all of us. That, that's always there. And I just, I try to explore that. I write the stories and then draft two and enhance the themes or enhance the portions that need to be strongest to link to the theme and to cut, you know, cut the trim. When I'm done with the story, I'm like, oh, here's another story that either someone's dead or someone's in the brink of life. They're not all morbid per se. They're all, some are kind of fun, like in volume three, I love Memo. Memo is the story of two sisters traveling across this fantasy scape 
and one of them is a ghost. And the great thing, you know, everyone knows ghosts and ghosts are only existing because they have unfinished business within these realms. And, you know, it's a positive story. I mean, yes, one character is dead, but it's the story of two sisters and bonding and traveling together. There's one also in yeah, volume three. I have a pre-apocalypse story. Everyone's going to die. Every, the whole planet's going to go explode. An asteroid's going to hit the planet a year and a half from the the date of the story. Doesn't matter. I mean, that it's in the it's in the far background. It's really just a story about teenagers hanging out in the future. The, there is a scene at a graveyard. I forgot. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> So it's more in the foreground, not like a morbid type of perspective on death. It's just more like it's there, you know, it's it's a part of all of us, but it's not pure fascination about it either. I don't know why it's one of these themes that I always explore between time and our perception of death. A little concerned, not really, but <laughs> a little concerned with the fact that, you know, you're a, you're 30 you're you're in your twenties and thirties there. Uh, you know, you're newly married for a year and you're not obsessing over death, but you're you're thoroughly exploring yeah. uh time and, and mortality, which to a certain extent is, is definitely everything that we all have to to deal with. And I'm glad that you're at least exploring it in a, in a healthy manner. Yeah. Uh, in, in that aspect. But what is it about mortality that that you're obsessed about, not obsessed, that you're you're trying to really deeply explore? I think it's just the finality of it. It's whatever your interpretation is in afterlife, but if you think there's something beyond this or not, there is, that's it for this. It's a common belief between, you know, religions and people's beliefs. Once you're dead, there is no coming back to whatever this is. One of my favorite creators is um, Richard Linklater, um, the director, he's done, you know, some screwball comedies and stuff, but when, he, when he does serious movies, they're serious. He did, uh, my favorite trilogy of movies, which would be, uh, the before series. It starts with, um, before, before sunrise. And it's a young Ethan Hawke in his twenties and, uh, French actress, Julia Delpy, and they explore the city of Vienna. They're on a train together and they randomly go and spend the night in Vienna. Nine years after that was filmed, Julie and Ethan went back to Richard Linklater and be like, hey, we wrote a script about these characters. This is a very two-character focused story. We we want to talk about these characters' lives because nine years in real time have passed, explore these characters again. And they did. And so that was before Sunset. And that was an interesting movie too, because that was in a, that was like a real time movie. So there's just, there's just constant playing with time. So like, it's basically like there's, there are cuts, but it's supposed to be like a very seamless, the two hours you spent watching the movie is like the two hours that these characters are interacting. Yeah. And then nine years post that was before midnight, which was yet another nine years in every, everyone's lives, either the film crew and the actors and and the characters and so now all these characters are in their early 40s i mean last year technically whatever before noon i guess would be the, the fourth one would have would have occurred and that would have been like everyone in their late 40s and the characters progressing that's kind of like what i try to accomplish through the montages and the perspectives of time and 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 death and all the experiences they've had the more flash forward version of that is the movie boyhood which was filmed i think in a 12 year period each year that was filmed it shows the progression of a young boy mason or that's the, the character's name mason as he progresses from like a kid into going off to college and the story itself it's beautiful storytelling you know they spent a couple of days once a year to film these film these scenes and it's seamless. Like they're not, there's no title card that says one year later, you just have to guess that every single time that the, the camera cuts, that it either cuts to the new scene or to continuation of the scene. Like they just switched rooms or they're now they're in a car type of thing. But you as, as a viewer are the ones that makes that distinction of, all right, are we, 
we won more into the f- year in the future or, or is it the same timeline? And it's just, I don't know, I just always think about that, that, um, and also just think that the, the daughter in that movie is Richard Linklater's daughter and he's filming as she's like the secondary character. She's, he's watching his own daughter grow through time as well. And it's just like this beautiful thing. And it's just, he's giving himself so much to this thing as much as he's, you know, it's his daughter, but like he's putting him so much of himself within his art and, and like so the progression of time, like it's not a, in the movie, it's not a gimmick, like of doing this thing. It's an experiment. And I think, it, I think it worked well. I just think, you know, you can do that exponentially with comics. It's amazing what you can do. And, and also, I mean, if you look at it from a, from a filmmaking perspective, you know, you have a director that is literally, you know, in the field most of his career and he's probably missing his family. And so he yeah. decides to do something along this line so he can not only spend time with his family, but also, you know, still do what he's passionate about and share in that, that love of, of filmmaking and, you know, love of family as well too. So it's, there's many different layers that you can, you can go in when it comes to that type of aspect as well. So many great stories. You have a Kickstarter ongoing. When is that Kickstarter going to, to end? It, uh, it ends Saturday, November 6th at 10 central time, 10 a.m. That's funded from what I saw. Like, yeah, it's, it's been beyond phenomenal. So earlier this year, like in June, we did a uh, Kickstarter for reprints of volume one and two. I wanted something that makes super unique. So these new volumes... Uh, of one and two have brand new art from all the artists. So you guys see this. So every story has a title card that, that says the creative team in this thing, but we have, you know, brand new art that encompasses every single title page. So that was phenomenal. Um, we got funded. It took us about three weeks to get funded. Um, since all the, our team was already paid at that point, then it was just for reprint fees. We had over 200 backers the week that I sent out, all the international um, books, you know, I think the week after is when I hit launch for volume three. Um, I tried timing it up so everyone had, at least had a chance to read both books. And then digital went out almost instantly. Yeah, and then so volume three came out and we had a phenomenal day one. I try to give some incentive for the people that, that are taking the risk to be the first backer. So always for these last two, and I'll probably do it for all continuing Kickstarters, on day one, I have a discount. Like I have a one day discount that is usually like two or three bucks less than what you would pay on the, on the other day. It's just incentivize people that have purchased one and two to give them some type of some type of thank you. Like if there was a way for Kickstarter to do coupons, like to do something where it would be that. Like I just said, like here's the coupon, you get free shipping if you get the next book or something you can't do that so this that's why i try to do the day one discounts you already know that these stories are great here's the next one and you know thank you for being there f- from the beginning i try and then also try to try to give incentives for everyone that is new uh, we got funded um and le- a little over a week it was like a week and a few hours from when i hit launch right now i think we're like uh, i think we're like uh, less than a hundred bucks from exceeding what was funded for the previous Kickstarter. It is an international assortment of creators. And in the Kickstarter, you can see, I, I credit everyone, I have their bios, but also next to the bios, I have, I have the flag of, of their country because it is a huge international one. This one had a lot more American creators than the normal, only because most of the letters that we used were all American letters. If you look at the last Kickstarter page, I think there's only like two or three. The two the two cover artists were American and maybe one other American, but everything else is purely international from volume one and two. My obsession with time is if, if I was trying to attempt being a comic writer 10, 15 years ago, it'd be a completely different process. I'd be going to my local comic shop and asking, I'd ask them. I just think of it like I'd be locked in proximity. I'd have to be someone within, you know, a 10 mile radius of me. I'd be chatting with every single person at every single comic convention, trying to, trying to figure out which creators, you know, I would, you know, I'd love to collaborate with. But now we live in such a digital age where I can 
contact. Like the last few stories that I've done, I've completed the script and I've posted on Twitter. Here's the script. This is a paid gig. It's this is the deadlines. I, I try to plan very ahead. Like the, the deadlines kind of far into the future. It's like six months from now. Like, let me know your page rate. Please respond with sequentials. And I've I found beyond talented artists that I've, I look at their profile and they only have a few hundred followers or less than a thousand followers. And they're just gorgeous. I mean, that's how I found Cassio who did connections and collisions who's beyond amazing. Um, Kyla, Kyla Smith. I found them or yeah, I found them through the Twitter. Uh, that's a story you haven't read yet. Oh, I found the, the cover artist, Katie Hicks. She responded to one of the, one of the stories I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I already found an artist. She had a beautiful wraparound cover. I'm like, I found an artist, yeah. but like, would you be interested of in doing the cover? Like, I love your, your single, like, I love your storytelling. Like, I love your comics. She wanted, I think she, she either nominated or won in Ignats. I'm like your illustrations are phenomenal. I want to collaborate with you in some way. And it was a true collaboration. I'm like, here, you know, the, the stories are a theme of light and darkness that's the theme of most of the covers is like, and she sent me, I think it took her like her 36 hours. And she sent me three very distinct sketches, fairly detailed sketches of, of that theme. And we went with what I thought was, I, I love this. this cover. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's the moon princess and the sun princess just hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, it's just like, I just keep looking like, I'm like, how, like, how is this something that like, I always say it's magic? Like how, this thing did not exist before I sent an email and before all of us started talking to each other. If she didn't, if she didn't see it at the right time and respond with her portfolio. And if I didn't make that decision and then if, if her schedule was too busy, you know, I want the best artists. So I want to make sure that they have flexibility in their schedule and that by adding this, story it doesn't stress them out because they're adding yet another you know another weight on their back i i did want to ask about the artist but you've touched on that so that's good because i you know you have to give proper credit where credit's due and the fact that you're using social media to you know contact these amazing talented people because honestly that's how i get all my interviews as well too i ask on twitter yeah <laughs> hence why you're here and uh and so overall it's, it's great to see this this connection through the internet you know, I could go another hour plus with you, really, but I do have to ask my introspective questions. Sure. But before I do that, is there anything else I haven't touched on before I get to my final questions that you'd like to showcase with those that are watching and listening to this interview? I mean, we're all indie creators. If you're watching this, you are most likely an indie creator. I don't know, just, just to take it like that, just like take a breath and realize we're doing something wonderful. We're doing something that so many people would love to do. Most, most of them are ourselves at a younger age. We were doing something that we personally never thought was possible. And that's to create stories that are read all over the world and that will be read in the future. And it's just amazing. Many, many people wish that they could be doing what we are all currently doing. And so we just need to just take a breath and realize what amazing things we are doing and what we can do in the future. At what point are we good enough? At what point are we good enough? I mean, it's, I, I would think it's a sliding scale. The benchmarks that we set for each other or for ourselves, I should say, it changes. Once we reach one plateau, you know, we see that there's one higher. We, we always want to achieve it. But the idea is that through the journey of a creator, because it is a journey, we're all just trying to, to get more readers, but also the internal struggle of making, I mean, you can call it art with the capital A, but we're trying to, to get the things that are within our head onto the piece of paper to then someone else look at that piece of paper to get the same things in their head. And that mishmash of a translation is a struggle and it's a process. You had to be able to forgive yourself. I mean, this, this is going to sound kind of weird, but like I was, I was at a dive bar last night and I was in the bathroom 
And usually in the bathroom, you know, there's obscenities and stuff. Someone wrote, forgive yourself on there. And it just, that just kind of stuck with me. And obviously it stuck with me enough that I'm bringing it up. What point is it good enough? I mean, like I said, it's going to change throughout your life, but as, as long as you're able to grow as a person emotionally, but also grow as a creator, then you're on the right track. And if you feel that you are slipping and you're either not making time for the things that matter most in life or that you're lashing out to your loved ones, then communication is the best thing. And just to seek, to seek some assistance, try to create something beautiful and, and be beautiful. When was the first time that you learned that language had power? It's when I was young. I, I'd like to say I learned like in the stories, like I'd learn someone could be like, well, you have to read this book. We had a, in our school, we had a library and like, it was like, all right, well, this is what every kid reads. And then it just like dawned on me that why, like, not why does every kid need to read this, but like, what is the, the, the thing that makes it what, like so coveted? Like, why is this the standard? You know, it would be like the Roald Dahl books or, you know, the hungry, hungry inch or it's called the hungry inchworm. That always interested me because it was like, it's one thing if we're all reading the same textbooks, but if we're reading this, all the reading the same books for fun and wanting to read the same books for fun, that put a light in my head that there is something that's not the not fun, which is the textbooks. And then there's the fun stuff, you know, any look at any book at the library and everyone gets it, but you can't get it because this is because everyone's trying to read the same book. My first foray into how powerful illustrations is. In the same library, there was one book in the dictionary section with male and female genitalia illustrations. And so that was, that book was, was picked up a lot. <laughs> so then we, as a child, I, I figured out the power of, of visual narrative. <laughs> then as a writer, what was the first thing that you wrote that you made you realize, yes, I could do this as a career? Uh, disclaimer, this is not my career, but this is an, a very absorbing, life-absorbing hobby that, that I do put 15 to 20 hours in uh, per week, whether it be listening to podcasts like yours or just, you know, cr doing the hard act of actually creating scripts. Creating that first script, that first inciting, like having the, the thing complete in my hand, I can say that, or I can say when those first thumbnails came in, so like the next step of the creation process as a writer. And that's my sole, um, my sole role in the creation process. I needed, you know, I needed others in order to create a comic book and to collaborate with. So when I first got those thumbnails and then it was a realization, like, this is a real thing. And it's addicting. Like I wanted more of that. Um, and that was the drive to, you know, constantly write more scripts. You know, that those first thumbnails, you don't forget that. Yeah. Those, I think those thumbnails, the first time I ever saw Hannah's thumbnails was a very, very distinct moment in my life. It was like, this is, this is what I want to do regardless regardless if i make any financial money off of it which is not going to happen it's that doesn't matter it's like this we're all storytellers this is this is us making stories and everyone has one person that inspired them on the path to where they are today who was that for you i think it would just be like the lineage that i come from so like my grandfather and my dad so i was an immigrant uh, i came to america post world war 2 he lives he was he was in Sicily and he had to go through the atrocities of World War II, being an Italian slash Sicilian, being POW. And I remember him a little bit. He died when I was 10. He always was just jovial and hardworking. That's what is all I ever heard. And so those traits were passed on to my father, very hardworking. Um, he's a small business owner, owns a restaurant. You know, most of my life, he worked 12 plus hours a day, never like really took any days off. You know, that work ethic was brought down. I, I think I absorbed that work ethic of just constantly knowing that maybe it's a, I do sometimes think of it as almost a burden where it's 
something where I need to constantly keep working towards something. From a professional standpoint, you've created two volumes. You are now kickstarting your third, and it sounds like you have many more in the pipe ready to go. And, and I can't wait to see where your future goes with this particular series and whatever else you decide to write in the future. So from a professional standpoint, you are successful, but do you consider yourself personally successful? Yes. And short answer is I'm creating, I'm, I'm creating stories and I'm actively, I have created in the recent past and I'm in the future. You know, I've, I've store ideas and loose ideas that I'm starting to untangle and make into a narrative. But I do want to just, you know, point out like full disclosure. I mean, even though I'm a short story writer, these scripts, they're five, seven, nine pages. I usually write an odd, odd number of pages. They take me three, four months to write a script because I'm building every single component from scratch. I have to build the world, these characters and the rules within these worlds. You know, I'm trying to make sure everything is sound before I pass it off to an artist. And then the artists spend another three, four months on it. Like these are long projects. So I try to tell myself and not beat myself up currently. Like I said, I do think I'm a success and that as long as you're creating, you are a creator. I don't want to say this to anyone that's listening there. There are going to be lull periods. And I've known I've beat myself up before mentally where I'm like, I haven't completed anything in like two, three months. You know, I'm still actually in the creation process. I'm not touching the keyboard that often, but I'm, it's still me still, you know, fizzling in my head. And as long as I'm still creating and I'm still actively wanting to create, then I'm a success. If, if I lose those two sparks, the spark of creation, the spark of wanting to create, I don't know. I'd, I'd probably be in a very dark place or like I said, or my life could be shifting. As mentioned, I've been married for a year. I might, you know, I'm going to, the next step is fatherhood and I'm not there yet. I'm not expected to be there, you know, in the near future, but it's going to be in the, and I know my life will change, but I still want to have those two sparks. I don't see them diminishing at all. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? They weren't failures per se. They were difficult situations that I've, that I've put in creatively. There have been times where artists have dropped out of projects suddenly, or I've not heard from artists for a large period of time. And I would get, you know, I'd get like a poor, like a, more thumbnails or I'd get more parts. I get like little bits of the thing of the project and it would seem that we'd be back on track, but then several more months go on. So that's just more delayed. Um, when things of that, na when things happen like that, when these roadblocks happen, the best way I got to say is just communication. I try, I try to be as openly communicable as possible with my, my creative, my creative collaborators. And I hope in turn, they do the same talk to other creators and ask them about experiences they have. Like when I've, when I had an artist drop out, I've asked my other writer friends of like, I'm, I'm not naming names or anything. I'm just saying like, I had an artist dropped out of this project. This is the deadline. What were your experiences from this? Go back kind of from the beginning of the, of the contact process and then just try to find new artists. But when, when f pure failures happen, I haven't reached that yet. As I want to make larger risks, like I want to, the next step for me is to make larger narratives, which means that the financial cost to pay these highly, highly skilled artists is going to increase. And I cannot pay these out of pocket anymore. And Kickstarter can only fund so much. But if we, if I do a Kickstarter and I feel utterly terrible when this happens, like if you, if you see a Kickstarter and it is for a relatively high goal of like eight, 9,000, they're shy, like 500 bucks or 600 bucks. And it doesn't, you know, it, it goes, that's it. No, no project. And it sucks. And I know that is a possibility every single time. I do one of these Kickstarters. I feel that when I'm taking larger financial risks, 
that there are failures ahead of me. And like when, when you were in the creation process, like I, I know that there are, there are possibilities that I cannot, it's these, this is not financially feasible and it might fail, but I still will try. But like I said, those are, those are the tough roads ahead. I, I know I'm at the, the most easiest part of my creative process or creative career right now, because I am using low stakes. I have enough finances that I can pay the artists out of pocket, but in the future, I know, I know it's going to be a tough road to climb. The young generation is looking at your work and eventually you will have the younger generation with you as well too, looking at your work and becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Just to be kind. I mean, this, as I've said before, we are doing something that is very rare and it's very unique and not many people have the gifts that we have, but also the ability to nurture said gifts. Like, there are natural talents within the creative process, but a lot of hard work is in between and people don't see it. We can do live drawings or I can go on Twitch and show me writing scripts constantly. It, it's a personal journey and there's so many hours of aloneness with you and whatever part of the creation process you're a part of. Like I, I want the next generation of creators to like look at the work and, and be amazed by it and want to achieve it and surpass it. I, I, I want to be as open and transparent about this. Like these things take a lot of time. It's a lot of personal time of you. You can say like honing your craft or, or learning more about whatever type of skill that you have and try to enhance it. But there's also a lot of time of actually doing these individual stories. And when you expound that into larger narratives, you know, it, it seems super glamorous when you go into a comic shop and you see a wall of new comics that came out this week, or you go to you know, the graphic novel section and you, you know, you, you see these, these books, but there's so much time. I mean, I think it's becoming more transparent. Um, like the larger book publishers, are doing that, they're making announcements. So like, you know, like Macmillan signed this, this creative team to do this book and it comes out in 2024. I think it's good when, when we all look at that and be like, all right, that means that they've already done a large portion. They've done a portion of the, the story. They've showed sample pages. And so that it's going to take that creative team these two and a half, three years to create the story, this 200 page story from scratch. So I want the younger generation to, to always keep that in mind. Cause I'm not, I really did not see that a lot in interviews of the generation that's above me. I came late into comics. I came late in, in my last year of college is when I got into comics. And when I, that was about 2010. And so I was reading stuff that was from the Vertigo series. So all those, all those writers around Vertigo and Image Comics is when I started getting into stuff. All those creators, I was reading interviews from them and they were, they were very helpful. But like I said, I never saw people talk about the amount of time it will take and to actually, you know, not to beat yourself up about, um, the lack of creation during a, a portion of your life. Like, like, all right, well, I spent all summer. I don't have anything to, to show for it. Or, you know, very recently, like, well, I had all this time in the pandemic and all my friends made, made books or they made like five zines and they have something tangible in their hands that they can do. And I just don't have, I don't have that. And I wanted that. And look at me, I'm a failure. I don't think that's healthy for anyone. And those unhealthy thoughts, I do not want, to be passed down to the generation and the generation before that of creators. I mean, like I said, we were doing something beautiful and it's always, always needed to needed to remind yourself that. Well, you know, I do hate to say this, Kurt, but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking, you know, thank you for coming on the show. I do greatly appreciate it before I let you go, because we have to obviously promote your social media. We have to promote this Kickstarter. 
Where can we find you? How can we support you on the internet? I'm heavily active on Twitter because it's easier to share images and links. And so that is my handle is my name. That's an easy Philip Myra, uh, two L's and Myra is M A I R A. And same thing with Instagram. I'm, I'm on Instagram and I post a lot on there too, but Twitter is usually just easier because I post a lot of links. Um, and yeah. Uh, currently crackle is on Kickstarter. You get all three books digital and physical all around the world. And, you know, you can go to Kickstarter and type in Crackle and it should pop up. I made a URL called cracklecomics.com. That's an easy forward you right to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm a comic book creator. I'm going to keep creating. I have very early uh, tentative plans to make uh, a larger anthology spring of 2022, which will probably be on Kickstarter for funding. And the idea is that, you know, I've done three uh, Kickstarters or I've done three volumes of Crackle and each of them are stories that I've written and I've collaborated with other artists. And so now I want to do an actual anthology where I, I do one story and then based off of a theme and I, I know what the theme is and you know, I invite my friends and people that I don't know because I want it to be open. I want to get as much, you know, I want to get as much submissions to, to get the biggest net of, of the best stories, the best creative teams, and, you know, make an anthology. But as of right now, I'm still, I have that project as like a curator editor. Um, but also I'm, I'm finalizing or I'm starting to uh, build. Uh, what I would like to call like my first, you know, long, longer narrative. I want to, I want around this time to, to be either completed or in the, the middle of the creation process for a longer narrative. I'm aiming towards something with like perfect bounce spine. So I like um, the brew baker, uh, Ed brew baker, Sean Phillips, uh, novellas that they've been doing. So I want to kind of do a 70 page story. Um, I have a good amount of, uh, I have it next to me. I've, I've, I write, I personally write everything down a spiral notebook and then that's draft one. And then draft two is me typing out into a word document, um, and then cleaning it up. So draft one and my spiral notebooks right next to me, but I won't show it. Um, but it's, Oh, you, at least, I mean, come on, you can at least hold up the book. Like. It's underneath a whole bunch of comics. So, yeah. That's not a bad thing. Oh, man, I got a whole bunch of stuff. It's hard to tell because I got, I write everything in here. So, like, here's, like, the early pages of, shit, uh, Connections and Collisions. It's just, like, and that's, nice. that's a space story, so I don't know about space stuff. Yeah. This is no. Well, I also write. Oh. It's also weird. I write backwards. I start on the last page. Like I, I, I do like manga. And that's how like I write. I, I start on the very last page. And I go. I go left. That's okay. that's okay. I was just curious to see the book. So yeah, I mean, I, it's all just chicken scratch. I think this one's. Uh, no, this, what, what is this one? Oh, this one's memo. <laughs> okay. Nice. But yeah. So yeah, um, it's in there somewhere. I, there's like, there's awesome. a chunk of 15 pages fully fleshed out. But yeah, I, I would like to, like I said, I know that there, and that could be a failure. It could be the artist that personally in my head that I would love to collaborate with um, is unavailable or uninterested. Uh, that can also happen. But um, yeah, I mean, a thousand things can go wrong. But as long as, you know, as long as it's, it's done and created and you're happy with it, I mean, that's, that's all that matters. I, I mean, I don't know how else to say it. It's like, we're, we're creating comics. We're doing something spectacular. Like, just, it, it's, it's, you should look like me. You should be smiling all the time. Like, it's just beyond amazing. <laughs> I love what you're doing. Keep creating what you're creating. I want to have you back on. Obviously, we'll 
do something next year yeah. for sure. Um, talk about your, your new anthology series maybe uh, in the future. Um, and I'd love to hear more about the artists that you, you pull for this, that particular project as well too. And, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. You yeah, obviously are doing something right and, and spectacular and you're enjoying it and everyone else is as well too, or else you wouldn't have three successfully funded Kickstarters. So keep, keep it, keep yeah. out. Thanks Kurt. This was, this is great. And you can, of course, find this interview and thousands of other interviews on our website, tgtmedia.com or 2geekstalking.com. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, which is actually more updated than the website, sorry, is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening watching on 2 Geeks Talking. See ya. Hey all, Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Uh, thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.